So this is chapter two, basic uh, diagnostic brush rental disease, which is good for the conference because, yeah, because this covers what we do. So there's, this is the things we consider diagnostic. Ophthalmoscopy is diagnostic, which is interesting. It does have an actually separate billing code. I don't know how long that's gonna last. And then we're gonna cover um, this SLO testing, which is the imaging in the autofluorescence multicolor near infrared, fluorescein, ICG, OCT, and I'm gonna to try to cover the new stuff, which I'm gonna do the best I can, and then B-scan, ultrasonography. <laughs> um, this was, I was at my uh, PTA event, and they had in the gym, when you're, when you're teaching, you should be thinking, what will I learn today? This is from a high school. How will I learn it? How will I know I learned it? And how and where will I use it? So, you know, what we'll learn today, we're going to learn about all the diagnostic testing and retinal diseases, and you're going to learn it just by listening to me. <laughs> this isn't like real interactive. Although in the clinic, you know, you, the, I, I did practice with indirect ophthalmoscopy, you know, and it's, you're, it's nice if you can practice on each other, or there are ways you can make a, uh, sort of a practice eye. It's a little, you have to Google it. You put a lens in a box. And, and then um, I want you to start doing these quizzes. I'm, I'm gonna push that. I, I've been really, really busy. And, um, but I'm gonna try to communicate with you on that. Because otherwise, if you don't test yourself, I don't think you'll learn it. And then you, you guys, this, all this stuff is relevant. I mean, even if you don't go into retina, most of this is relevant. So this is unlike medical school, where almost nothing's relevant to what you're gonna be doing. <laughs> Everything here is going to be relevant, so I think it's important you learn it. Um, this is kind of a lot on one slide. So ophthalmoscopy includes direct ophthalmoscopy, which, I don't, do you have them in your clinic lanes? Do you have a direct ophthalmoscope? Okay, I don't, I've not used a direct ophthalmoscope, I think, in 25 years. Um, it gives you an upright image. It's uh, very well magnified, and it's a super small field. You don't need to dilate the pupil. If you're going to do it, you have to get super close to the patient. And you're going to have to learn to switch eyes, otherwise you're going to be doing mouth to mouth with them. So you have to look with your right eye at their right eye and your left eye at their left eye. Or you're going to, your lawyer will be calling you. The ruby lens is the lens that's on all the slit lamps. And I think you have these too. I, I occasionally use the ruby lens. It gives you a upright image and it lets you see the vitreous. And I have to say, I keep I talk, I had a really nice year with Dr. Gass. Dr. Gass only used the ruby lens. He never used the handheld lenses. And, um, and I asked him once, he said I could never quite get the hang of it. And uh, he's a funny guy, but, um, which I think was true. But you have to move the eye around. But sometimes for looking at subtle vitreous or subtle retinal things, ruby lens is useful. And then there's the indirect ophthalmoscopy, which includes um, slit lamp lenses and and, and the headset, and then there's contact lenses. So with indirect ophthalmos ophthalmoscopy, um, you, when you're setting your headset up, I don't know if anybody's told you this, but I put, my, I, look, I put it on and I look at my thumb with the light, and I put the light so it's kind of at the top of my field. So let's say I'm looking, let's say my face is the visual field, you see where your circle is. I put the, where your, your field of view is my face, I put the circle here. I put the light circle at the top, and then that gets you a pretty good view. Not way at the top, so we'll put a little bit up. And then darken the room. Don't put the light too bright or the patients will be upset. And then always have a routine. All your stuff you need to have a routine. You do right eye, left eye, and you to go a certain way, you know, clock hours around the way. And uh, there's a few things that are not intuitive about indirect ophthalmoscopy. One is when you're having trouble seeing, either because it's a small pupil or there's media opacities or the capsule's bad, what you want to do is back away like this. Your tendency when you can't see something, especially you guys because you're not presbyopic like me, is to get closer and closer and closer and, um, and you'll, you won't see it. But if you, almost all pupils, if you back away and back away and back away, it, it cones the light through and you get a better view. Keep the lens still. Yeah, keep the lens still. You can move it back and forth. I have a thing in here on lenses. Yeah, I have a thing on the different lenses. I'll show you that. Um, so real versus virtual image. This is some, This is all stuff you need to know. I don't need to know this. Um, a real ver real image, the, I think the easiest way to remember is real, real images are always inverted. They actually will emit light. They're actually, there's actually an image there. And um, they can be projected onto a screen. And the light actually converges there. Virtual images are opposite most of that. So they're upright. They're, um, um, they're where light appears to have converged, but it doesn't actually, and they can be seen by a detector, even though they can't be projected on a screen. 
So when you look in the mirror, is that real or virtual? It should be like two seconds. Virtual. Virtual, because it's upright. So I remember it's upright, virtual, inverted, real. It's an easy way to remember it, because otherwise it's super confusing. And then the diagram kind of shows you how they form and where they are. Um, so the magnification and field of view is important on all your different lenses, because you're partly for board purposes, but partly because you're going to need to pick a lens. I, I use a 20 for the indirect and a 78 for the slit lamp, but you, there are 20, 28s, and 30s, and there's 78 and 90s, and there's wide field 90s and regular 90s. So magnification has to do with the eye power, which you approximate at 60 diopter, and you divide that by the power of your lens, which is a 20 lens, a 78 lens, or a 90 lens, and that gives you the magnification of the lens. Um, so the lower power is going to give you more magnification. So a 20 diopter lens would give you three times magnification because 60 divided by 20 is three. If you're doing the slit lamp, though, you got to add that into the magnification. So if you're, you know, which is 10 or 10 or 16 for the hog stripe, which is most of my slit lamps. So if I had a 60, if a 90 diopter lens is a little less than one, you multiply that, whatever that is, 90 is one is. Uh, Anyway, it's six over nine is two thirds, and then you multiply that by nine, so it's it's whatever that is. I would multiply that by ten, and that gives you the magnification of the slant. And then the field of view is tricky because it has to do with the diameter of the lens, the distance to the eye, and then an equation. So don't worry about the field of view. But in most of the lenses, the closer you hold them to the eye, the better you're going to do. Which takes a while with slit lamp biomicroscopy. So what I do is I. I have a whole routine. I, I put the lamp in, I line the light up with the eye, and then I flip the lens in. But it's all very quick now because I've been doing it forever. And then I put the lens very close to their eye and I back up a little. And usually that gives them my image. You back the lamp all the way up before you flip your lens in. And you can see the eye in the distance. Then you'll get it. When I, I used to teach medical students, I kind of stopped that. But um, I had some medical, oh actually Karen was my medical student long, long time ago, uh, Greenberg. Um, and I, that's the one thing I would try to teach them slant by a microscopy, because it's learnable, and it's not that hard. Um, these are the working distance and the magnifications of your lenses based on you know, the textbooks. And so the 20, 28, and 40 are um, 3, 2.1, and 1.5 for magnification. The field of view is about 50 degrees. So if you're working your way around, you know, you've got 360 degrees to cover, if you imagine, um, you know, 180 degrees, you really could cover that in probably three views. So if you're looking, most of the time, if I'm looking at a peripheral retina, I look, you know, up, I do eight points of exam if I'm looking for a tear. And if you get, I know some retina people, and I try this sometimes where they'll actually look as the eye's moving so they don't miss anything. So, but it can be nauseating, literally. So if you, if you have somebody look up and then look to the right, and look as it moves, you, you sweep the eye a little bit. With your slit lamp, and the working distance on this, I think is a little close for the, because I was looking at these, I think it's true, it's slit lamp biomicroscopy, you wanna get the lens pretty close to the eye, you know, almost creepily close to the eye. Some of the lenses, the super field lens has a, has a rim on it that's deep enough that you can't hit the eye. You could actually, it hits the area around the eye first. Um, for the, Indirect lenses, this gives a working distance of five centimeters about, which I think is too close. I actually, because I was checking this before I gave the lecture, I tend to hold the lens, I put my pinky and finger on their eye and I hold the lens about that far away. And that usually gives me a good view. Um, so that's all for ophthalmoscopy. Any more questions for that? And kind of draw it as you're doing it. Do you guys do drawings? Do you? So, mm -hmm. uh, you, can, you know, you try to use that on this computer, really, right? Yeah, yeah. on that picture, like, a little button. And some, yeah. some of the tendings like it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'll generally draw detachments. I usually, I don't draw everything. I don't draw maculas anymore. Some people used to draw maculas. Again, it's, you can charge for drawings. It's a little weird, but it's not much. Mm -hmm. right. Now drawings pay a little bit. Yeah. And, I, and I do draw detachments because it's nice to know later. So that's ophthalmoscopy, which is considered part of the testing, and, and uh, you'll get better. And it's all learnable. The more you do it, the better you get at it. And I, I have to say, even my medical retina, I did a separate medical surgical. Even in my medical retina year, I had trouble looking at a surgical retina eye for pathology through a gas bubble. Because we'll, we have patients with a cataract, a gas bubble, a bubble in the anterior chamber, and you're trying to see the retina. And actually, the more you, you'll be, you can do it. It just is really hard. Yeah. 
Any tips for uh, people that are trying to learn uh, spinal depression? Any better at that? I uh, yeah make. The, this is a couple of things. One is make sure you're lined up. So what, what, if, what I'll do is if you look at where your depressor is, kind of look at the depressor, look at the pupil and where you are and make sure you're not side to side. Mm -hmm. And then I always warn the patient before it's kind of unpleasant. I say it's a little bit unpleasant. And then I tuck it in and just kind of, I don't push into the eye, I kind of push back toward the orbit. So I'm not pushing on the eye directly. I'm kind of sliding it back a little bit and then nudging in. That's, that's not a lot. And I, I use a depressor, I don't use a Q-tip. But a lot, some people think a Q-tip is better, some people think a depressor is better. Temporal and nasal, do you ever pop onto the con for that? Yes, I do. If there's, if there's pigment in the anterior vitreous, or, and I'm looking for, I know there's a tear. And so I have PVD with a little bit of heme, you don't hop into the cons, you just sort of skip the... No, I look, I look and I back up a little, and I look oh, a lot. With the depression. But I don't depress on the, on the eye. On three and nine. For a vitreous hemorrhage. You I do. do. You do? Okay. I do. Yeah, I don't if think... I, if they got a floaters and flashes, I'm not that good. I'll yeah. go up and check it and put Optane in, it's usually fine. Yeah. So I, I, I do depress. And the other thing you'll find is you'll, you'll realize which of your patients had a bunch of lid surgery. Because if you go to depress right. someone, once you've got, there's nothing, there's nowhere to depress. Because <laughs> if there's pigment, I depress. If, if there's, because because if you look at a PVD with hemorrhage, the risk of a tear in someone, this is actually our paper, the risk of a tear in someone who's on anticoagulation is about 30% in a PVD with hemorrhage and someone who's not on anticoagulation has a risk of a tear about 50%. So if you don't find the tear, I'll look with the, I'll look every way, but I don't always depress the tear. The other thing, if you're going to start learning, do it on all your, just depress one quadrant, just, you know, just lay them down, do the outer temple, that's the easiest to start. Yeah, the most unpleasant is super nasal. Right. And I have to say, I, I, I'm I, just used, to, my routine, starting at 12, and I go around temporal and come around this way on everybody, and that's just the way I do it. I don't know that it's not better if you're starting to go around the other way so you get the worst part out of the way first. Yeah, it's better to get them prepped. That's what I think. So, so I generally, that way they're used to the depression when you get to the worst part, which is super nasal. And if you're not seeing your depressor, it, I still have that. I'll be depressing eyes, and I'm, I'm not seeing the depression. I'll back up and realize I'm off a line. Don't push harder. Yeah, yeah don't that's, push that's harder. And sometimes you're too far back. Sometimes you get someone with real big lids, and you pull it up a little. It's like, oh, it's way back. And the other thing is move it if you're not sure, because yeah, wiggle. sometimes you just don't, you don't see them. The bump. Yeah. Especially, and then that's good to do because if you're going to cry or retinal tears later, you hate to like lose the cryo and realize you were like a, on the edge of the macula. When you're depressed, yeah, when you're crying, <laughs> you know, because that'll I've seen all these things. So you know, someone will be crying and they're like, oh my gosh, you know, so you got to back up. <laughs> I would have trouble. Like, when you're living in depression, will you scoot a couple millimeters to the side before you pull out and then? Yeah, you kind of go back and forth a little bit, yeah. And because you can fish, that's where you, because part of the depressor is to see, but part of it is to open up tears, if there's a tear there, a subtle tear. Hey, uh, a patient with new flashes floaters after cataract surgery, how soon can you depress them? <laughs> this all changes, because we yeah. used to stitch land, we used to stitch, I don't know that you can depress them the first month. Because though you could fish like open month, those, four weeks, yeah, four, four to six. Length. The cataract guys could probably answer that better. Those okay. incisions don't, you know, if you push on the back of those incisions, you can pop them open. You know that. So, and I have to say, in a yeah. freshly operated, a yeah, freshly yeah. operated yeah. cataract yeah. eye, I mean, the new incisions are super small, right? Yeah. 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 Tiny. Yeah. Um, okay. You can yeah. often see yeah. if you yeah. if you back up. On a freshly operated cataract, where, the cat, where they've taken all the lens out and the capsule's crystal clear, I can see out to the aura a lot of the time without depressing. So you can back, because you'll be looking at the edge. It's such a nice view. So in those with a decent pupil, you don't need to. All right, um, scanning laser ophthalmoscopy. Um, this is what all the images are taken nowadays. It's a sweeping laser. It's not a camera, which is nice. It has several advantages. And then there's pinhole optics. There's a pinhole at the camera. There's a pinhole um, by the by the aperture. And what that does is it eliminates all the noise. So and, I, and there's a very high frame rate and very high magnification because it's a laser and it's a video camera. So it's not like you have to realize we took flash pictures before. This is just history, I guess. So every the flash had to recharge. 
So you couldn't see feeder vessels, but now you get whatever, 60 frames a second or 30 frames a second. It's very comfortable, and you can get very high resolution because you register the image. But you don't get this stuff if you don't ask for it. So sometimes if you're, you have to tell your staff that I want you to lock, like for the ICGs, there, there's some people will be in the routine of not getting an ICG until a minute because people have this idea that ICG is interesting later. If you're looking for feeder vessels, you need it about 30, 40 seconds, and you need them to lock the ICG and build it so you get a high resolution image. So sometimes you have to tell your photographer all that. So I'll stand there. I go into the camera. It doesn't take that much time. I'll do the injection sometime and stand there. All right, so for infrared, Imaging, it looks at the outer retina of the RP and Brooks membrane, and you can see subretinal fluid, and you can see acute macular neuroretinopathy, reticular pseudodrusin, and it's a 820 nanometer laser that captures it. These pictures are supposed to show you the, how easy it is to see reticular pseudodrusin in the infrared. Whereas if you look at a color picture, sometimes you're not sure they're there, but you look at the infrared and they're super obvious, all these little dark spots. They tend to be superior macula, and they're important for macular degeneration. And then the image on your left is acute macular neuroretinopathy, and you can see that um, dark spot on the infrared. And I was just talking to a retina specialist pretty late, um, two nights ago, he called me, about a friend of his who had a sc paracentral scotoma and said all he saw was something on the infrared. And um, for acute macular neuroretinopathy, that's all you'll see. The autofluorescence is normal, FA is normal, ICG is normal, but the infrared's not. So it's a nice test for this. And then this was a poster I did at Academy on the other side, where if, this is just something really funny, and if you don't know what it looks like, it can bother you. If someone's had retinal attachment repair, all these little pockets of subretinal fluid on the IR will show up as little, little dots um, for a while. So it's little pockets of subretinal fluid are strikingly evident on the infrared. Um, so that's infrared. <clears throat> it's interesting to know just because you, you always get it. So people bring them to conference and you're always going to get infrared on all your patients. So it's nice to be able to interpret it. Autofluorescence. There are a lot of pigments in the eye that autofluoresce. The corneal epithelium and endothelium lens, macula, and RPE. Some of the stuff in my lectures I, don't, I never knew before I read your book. So this is right out of your book. So I, don't, so, so I don't know why that matters. I think it's probably, I can tell you though, if you have someone with a three or four plus cataract, you're not gonna get a good autofluorescence image because the cataract's gonna wipe out the autofluorescence. So it is somewhat clinically important, but I would, if I was writing an exam, I would put that on the exam for your ports because it's, it's like, it's just something most people wouldn't know. So autofluorescence, cornea, lens, macula, and RPE. And then uh, pathological autofluorescence, we think of mostly as optic nerve drusen, or subretinal deposits that have to do with lipofuscin and outer segments. And the picture right here is a 20 or 30 something year old guy that we showed last conference with uh, optic nerve drusen. Um, and then the physics of fluorescence. This is a, 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 a comb jellyfish that uh, bioluminesces. I got the picture, it was in the Wikipedia comments, very pretty. Um, so there's, there's several ways, this, is, this can, is complicated and I have trouble with a little bit, but there's several ways that things can emit light. And several ways that light, things can, can emit light. There's luminescence where they make their own light, which like the sun, or light bulb, which is incandescent, but it is luminescence. Bioluminescence, like the organism in the picture. Fluorescence is when things emit light after absorbing energy instantaneously. So pretty much, you shine the light, it comes right back. And then phosphorescence is when the things emit light later, because the uh, electron's excited, it's going down, but it's taking slow. So that's like glow-in-the-dark things uh, on your watch dial. I like this because people are talking at meetings now about cyanescence. They'll show an ICG, and I've seen it published in journals. They'll say this cyanescence, which is not a word. So don't use it, please, in my conference. Um, so anything can fluoresce, it can luminesce, it can, it can phosphoresce, but you can't cyanus. Um, so fundus autofluorescence, like that, that case we had today, which is really cool, is, um, it has to do with photoreceptor outer segments. There's um, damaged RP retinoids there. The RP ingests them, and then the, R the phagosomes in the RP form the lipofuscin, which is mostly A2E. And then the A2E molecules are, are two molecules of vitamin A and one molecule of ethanolamide, and that auto, that autofluoresces like crazy. The RP cells phagocyze three billion outer segments in their lifetime, and, and so it's an enormous amount of, auto, of, of, of 
digestion they're doing. And as you get older, up to 25% of your cells are, are full of lipofuscin. So that's, a nor that's, not an, that's normal aging. Um, and lipofuscin will autofluoresce. So you hit it with the light. And then the thing to remember is dead cells don't autofluoresce. So when you're looking at autofluorescence image, if there's a lot of lipofuscin, either because there's been a lot of shedding or you got diseased RPE, they can't process it or whatever, you'll see those bright spots. Or if the outer segments are trapped in the subretinal space, you'll see bright spots. But if there's a dead spot, it goes dark. Um, this, and then autofluorescence is going to be important probably in our eventual treatment of progressive geographic atrophy because you can sort of predict rate of progression based on the autofluorescence at the edge of the atrophy. So this was a patient I had with uh, patchy geographic atrophy where the edges are totally dark and the risk of that progressing is actually very low. This will probably look the same in 10 years. Whereas if that whole area in the middle was dark and bright, you can pretty much draw a circle around everything that's bright and that'll be dead within about five years. Um, and then you can see um, autofluorescence is nice in hereditary retinal disease and chronic recurrent central serous. I don't get my hereditary, I, a bunch of, actually this case I was going to show today, um, hereditary retinal disease, I don't get FAs that much anymore because I think the autofluorescence is fine. So does anybody know what this is? With the macular problem and the little white spots under the retina that hyper autofluoresce? No, it's close. It's, um, they're, they're shaped kind of like fishtails, the white spots, the Pisciform white yeah, spots. So uh, Stargardt's, so star yeah. So Stargardt, this is Stargardt's disease. So you get the macular atrophy, Pisciform hyperfluorescent spots. <clears throat> and, if, and the one thing to realize, which you may have in the future, is your autofluorescence is always relative autofluorescence. So you're not getting absolute. If you could do absolute autofluorescence in Stargardt's, this person would be way off the chart. Uh, but it's, it's relative, so. Um, this is a patient who's been on a medication that's caused some damage to the RPE. You can see a little hyperautofluorescent sort of bullseye area, which is from Plaquenil. Generally, you don't want it to get to this point. You'd like to find it on the OCT first, but that's still pretty early. And then this is a patient who sent to me with macular, unusual macular OCT. They, they, they did the OCT in the left eye, and the patient I don't think was symptomatic, but had funny looking tests. In the, color pictures were very subtle. And I was thinking, oh my gosh, the differential is pretty long for this patient, all sorts of dystrophies and stuff. And then I got the autofluorescence, like, oh, it's obviously chronic central serous because you can see the, there was a leaky area there, it dripped down, this is classic guttering, and it's a lot of dead RP, so this has been going on for a long time. Um, so the, this area is diseased on the left, and then the other areas are dead. And the phobia is completely spare. I think you run by yeah. the last slide real quick. The, oh. This is abnormal here? Yeah, yeah. it's very subtle, but that, that's all you're going to get in Stargardt. In uh, uh, plaquenil toxicity, the little bright area, which I can't see here, but it should be about there. Yeah, I can sort of appreciate that. Yeah, there's a little brightness on the infrotemporally in both eyes from the, um, yeah, plaquenil. So you stop it for this? What's that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. But the OCT would have shown more striking. So the OCT would have definitely shown outer retinal problems because okay. the, the, the um, autofluorescence is a little bit late. Now we mostly get OCTs. Autofluorescence you have to dilate people for too. I have to say with my OCT scans being as good as they are, I don't dilate people a lot of times now. Even my AMD patients, if they're coming in for treatments in a scan, I don't need to dilate them. I dilate people probably you know twice a year maybe. Yeah, it's not very, it's easier. The visits are quick, it's nicer for them. Um, so that's, so your SLO images will be the, the IR, autofluorescence. You also can get multi, multicolor, and then there's the blue, which I don't use very much. Um, and then fluorescein angiography, you need to know this. Again, we're, we might be getting away from this, but at the moment, you excite with blue, you emit green. It was developed by medical students, which is kind of interesting. Um, the excitatory laser or filter is about 488 on the SLO, and then you have a barrier filter 500. So the principle is you're shining a light in the eye, and then you're not you're blocking that wavelength from coming back. So you're not getting any reflection. You're just getting where the where the light changes color, where the fluorescence is. Super important that 20% of fluorescein is not protein bound, so it can be visualized very easily. Um, 
Yeah, 20% is not protein bound. That might be a typo. It might be 20% is protein bound. No, it says it says unbound in the book. 20% is not? Okay. So that, so that's the, what you're seeing. The protein bound stuff you're not seeing, the 20% is what you're seeing in the fluorescein. And that's what leaks. So the protein bound stuff doesn't leak so much, the, the free stuff leaks like crazy. And it, it, it's a good gauge because fluorescein doesn't pass an intact blood renal barrier. So that's why the blood renal barriers are suited. If you're doing a floor, this used to be fluorescein conference. If you're doing fluorescein conference, you're pretty much looking the entire time at the blood renal barrier. And so you need to know where it is. So the blood renal barrier is the RPE and the endothelial cell tight junctions of both of those. And the fluorescein won't pass that if it's intact, but if there's a problem with it, it'll leak. Howard Schatz, who I think is still alive, is a, was an excellent teacher who had books on uh, retina decades ago, used to teach fluorescein different from what we do it, but he would say in the early fluorescein images, you're intravascular, and in the late images, you're extravascular. And it's a nice way to think about it physiologically. And so what's happening is in the late, you're seeing the stuff that leaks out and, and everything else washes out. Um, so these are all the phases. And I wanted to talk about this because we're always going face, face, face. So the fill is, the first, is, is in the first eight to 12 seconds, and that's when it first hits the eye. And then there's a brief choroidal, actually that's not really a phase because it's dark. The choroidal phase is the first phase, and that's super, super short. It's less than a second. The choroid fills and the retinal vessels are dark. And you can see the brightness in the choroid. And um, it's sometimes patchy filling. It's a little tricky now because you're seeing the autofluorescence too from the RPE. Um, and then the transit phase is the first 10 to 15 seconds, which is broken into arterial, arterial venous, and laminar. Okay, so you get the arterial phase, which is, which is almost of no importance unless you're looking for branch artery occlusion. Arterial venous is when it starts to come around. Laminar is when the vessels start to fill from the side. Peak phase is at about a minute. And then later you get recirculation, which is when the dye starts to leave the eye and you can see some of the pathology because you're seeing where the dye is left behind. And then late phases is where the dye is pretty much out of the vessels, out of everything, and you're just seeing things that have stained. And things that stain are choroid, Brooks membrane, sclera, all stain. And then large choroidal vessels darken. You can see that in the other picture. So one way, which we're probably going to keep harping on every single month, is there's two causes of hypoautofluorescence. Okay? One is a vascular filling defect, which is either vessels obstructed, arteries obstructed, veins obstructed, capillaries obstructed, there's a defect. The other one is something's blocking. And things that block are typically pigment and blood. Fibrosis, I guess, can too, and, and uh, exudates can, but it's mostly pigment and blood. And this is a picture from last month. So this is a patient we showed with Coates disease. So you can see a large area where there's blockage, but also you see the blood, where there's not perfusion, and there's medium vascularization, and then you can see the blood. Um, so if you got blockage from the first one, which is vascular filling defect, and the second one, which is blood. Oh, that was nice. And then there's five causes of hyperfluorescence, and what, which was what we were going on and on about today. One is when fluid's leaking, so, it, and that's where you see increasing fluorescence in the early phases, and there's a breakdown of the blood retinal barrier, and the borders blur. So for leakage, it's more, I don't, it's not so much for me the increasing in fluorescence because of the digital systems can wash that out, it's more the border blurring, so that's leakage. Staining is when fluorescein fills a solid tissue, and that's drusen, scar, optic nerve, and sclera. So that's all staining, that's what we're talking. And then pooling is when fluorescein fills a fluid-filled space, which can be a PED, which we saw today. A window defect can be hyperfluorescence, and again, that's because you're losing the RP overlying the area and you're seeing the underlying sclera which is staining. So that kind of hits staining, but we really, really, if you were being tested on it, that would be a window defect. And then, um, and then, uh, my ways is telling me it's time to go. And then autofluorescence, I love the internet. Autofluorescence is the last one, which we didn't used to have because autofluorescence will cause hyperfluorescence on fluorescein, but only when the fluorescein signal is kind of washed out. So in the very early signals or the very late signals. So those are your five. So if you see hyperfluorescence, it's got to be one of those. With, with medicine, ophthalmology, and retina specifically, everything, there's nothing you're going to see that's new. The chance of you seeing something new is very, very 
unlikely. It's, you know, there's 7 billion people or 9 billion people in the world. So when you see a lesion, when you see something bright, there's always a, it's always categorizable. So if there's a bright area on fluorescent angiography, it's going to be one of these five. And if there's a dark area, it's going to be one of those two. Adverse effects of fluorescein. Your skin turns yellow. I always thought it would be good to go clubbing after fluorescein because if you get under the blue lights, you'd be glow. Um, and then your urine's bright yellow, which is what my staff tells people because it freaks them out. Um, nausea and vomiting is not uncommon, especially in children. So if you're doing a fluorescein in like a 12-year-old and you get the, what I do is I inject the fluorescein and I, I give them a garbage can and I get out of the room because they always throw up. And my staff's like, oh, you'll be okay. And then um, you, can get, you can get a uh, vasovagal reaction. And then you can get extravasation, which isn't a big deal. And then you can get various reactions, which are itchy. It's okay to do them. And you can get death. And I had one. It's not very common. There's a small risk of a cardiac arrest with a fluorescein angiogram. And I don't know if it's statistical, like everybody dies at some point. But I had a guy I did a fluorescein on. My staff called me and said he's looking like he's having a reaction. And he was clearly dying. He was frothing in the mouth. And I laid him down and we did CPR. We got him to the hospital. You, you don't have that defense? Yeah, we have all that. So we have, we have epinephrine. And it's true, if someone's having an anaphylactic reaction, you can give them epinephrine in the thigh. That's what I talk about here, which if you want to review this later. Adult, it's 0.3 um, to 0.5 cc, so you can repeat every 5 to 15 minutes. Um, intramuscular is preferred. Just stick them with that. If they're, honestly, 911 comes really fast, and you guys are right on the medical campus. Are you in training or at the time? Or Oh, with this guy, I had. no, it's private practice. No, I just masked him and I waited because it wasn't an anaphylactic reaction. It was like an arrest, and so I laid him back, masked him. His heart was beating, and then we waited for 911 to come. And it was a weird experience because they came. They were like lolly. They were like moseying into the office, and then when they saw the patient, they said, "You should have said it was a cardiac arrest." And I said, "I thought like 911 was like you come emergent. It's like emergency." But apparently there's levels of 911. You know, there's the guy that, you know, there's this Florida man who was at Subway and they didn't put enough mayonnaise on his sandwich. You know, that one, which you, you know you can read about on the Twitter feed. And then there's uh, cardiac arrest. So if you have a cardiac arrest, you can call 911. So the difference between fluorescein and ICG, there's several differences. ICG is 98% protein bound, which is pretty much completely, and it doesn't fluoresce much. It's 4% the efficiency of fluorescein. So those are two huge differences. So when we look at ICG images, like when you were, we were looking at the sclera, which really doesn't stain with ICG, it's because it's protein bound, it doesn't release from intact choroidal vessels or choroid capillaris, and it doesn't, it doesn't fluoresce that well. Limited diffusion in the choroid capillaris, and the other thing is the wavelengths are different. So it excites at um, 8.05, emits at 8.30, which is long enough to go through the RPE. So the, the two big, three biggest characteristics that make it totally different, which is why I do ICGs a lot of times in my first AMD patients. The three biggest are protein bound, so you can look at the integrity of the choriocapillaris, and it, um, it um, emits a different wavelength, and it uh, is much less efficient. I guess the main two are protein bound. And you can visualize feeders. So it's helpful for things. It's helpful for looking at retina angi angiomatous proliferation because you see the hot spots, polypoid or cord vasculopathy, you can't see without ICG. And you do treat it a little bit differently in some cases. Um, so you'll look at feeder networks and polyps. You'll only see those on ICG. Central serous, if you're looking for where the PDT and you want to know where your choroid's the leakiest, you, you fluoride. Fluorescein will show you hot spots, but if you really want to put a, a big spot somewhere, the central the uh, ICG is helpful. And then if you're looking at tumor vasculature, and then if you're looking at a patient with a possible white spot syndrome, like the case we wrote up, um, she had mutes, recurrent mutes, which had an ICG that was patchy dark, but then she had AMN, which was really weird, and the ICG is normal. So the ICG will differentiate some of the white spot syndromes from each other. This shows a patient who had central serous retinopathy, and there was, a, there was an area on the ICG that was bright compared to the rest of the ICG. And you, only, you don't see this, you see this at about five or 10 minutes. So you don't see it at 15 or 20 minutes, it washes out. Although 15 or 20, you do see these plaques sometimes, but you won't see this in the first five minutes. Excuse me. Um, and then this is polypoidal cordovasculopathy. You see the fluorescein on top and the ICG on the bottom. The fluorescein shows the PED, but the ICG shows the polyps. 
And so for polypoidal for vasculopathy, uh, you need a vascular network and polyps. In the first, I think the Everest study, it's the first six minutes of the test I have to show up. This is a get, oh look, it's working. So this is a patient I had with a pulsating polyp. Isn't that cool? On ICJ, you see the arrow? So, um, so sometimes you'll see that on, uh, on uh, polypoidal cordovasculopathy. In this patient, if you PDT that, it would all seal up. I have to say, the visual results are awfully good with shots, so I generally don't even start with PDT. Adverse events aren't bad with ICG. It is contraindicated in people with an iodine allergy and um, shellfish. And in your book, it lists a bunch of stuff. I don't know where, that, liver disease, renal disease, sulfur penicillin allergy, and metformin. Um, but I've not seen that anywhere outside of the basic clinical science book. So typically in the package in certain practice, we, we avoid in people with iodine and shellfish allergies. Um, OCT is really super important. So OCT is a 5 to 10 micron resolution. And you're, any questions on ICG and FA? We could, we could like go over and over in a conference. Um, OCT is super duper important. You're looking at um, very high resolution. Things that reflect on OCT, it's probably a lot of it's mitochondria. The more people are looking at OCT, the more it seems like you're looking at mitochondria. RPE fluoresces like crazy and, um, and nerve fiber layer does. And then vitreous and fluid are low. There's spectral domain OCT and swept source OCT. So the and, um, spectral domain has a, a low coherence laser. It's a super luminous and diode, which does sort of a spread spectrum. And then that reflects, all the OCTs go to a reference mirror into your, whatever you're imaging. And then it merges the image back. It does sort of a diffraction because your wavelengths shift a little bit and then you dissect it with a camera. The spectral domain is way better than time domain, which I didn't even bother putting in here, but it still is slower than swept source. And swept source has a tunable laser, so you're, you're, sweet, you're doing different laser wavelengths, a beam splitter, reference mirror in the eye, and then it goes back to a point photo detector, which is much faster than the um, diffraction grading camera. So swept source can be much faster than spectral domain. It's supposed to also be cheaper but it's way more expensive now because it's new. So go figure. So I'm way, I don't have a swept source yet. I think you guys do. So SDOCT is a shorter, way, uh, shorter wavelength, less sensitive detective, and images can be superficial or deep. You don't get the, you can do EDI or superficial. Swept source gives you multiple layers because you're going back and forth. It's much faster, and um, it's a smaller machine. You can crank press it all into a smaller machine. It's supposed to be cheaper. All the, par all the components are cheaper. When we started doing photodynamic laser, the laser to do photodynamic laser cost $50,000. And all it was was it had the power of a laser pointer. And it got me so aggravated. But it's just because there was one supplier and it's new. You know, now, now you can get PDT lasers off of eBay for like 5000 10000 bucks. But um, the swept source OCT shouldn't be so expensive. When you look at an OCT, you should think about the retinal layers. I have a bunch of videos on our, on our website, which I'll give you, on reading OCTs. But you should be sort of thinking ganglion cells, photoreceptors, outer segments. When you look at the OCT, you should be thinking retina. Here's the OCT from the inside out. And I, this wasn't. So the internal limb membrane is the first thing you kind of don't really see. It's in front of the retina. And then the next thing you see is nerve fiber, which is bright. I put these bright where they're bright and dark, where they're dark. And the nerve fiber is reflective, the ganglion cell layer is not. So pretty much anything with nuclei is dark. Your inner plexiform is bright, your inner nuclear is dark, outer plexiform is bright, outer nuclear is dark. Then you get to the lines in the back, which are something that are, they, these are, I think are very important because they give you an idea of visual function and we do talk, talk about them and I think they're gonna be important for treatment. So the first one's the external limiting membrane. A lot of times if that's intact, the visual function should be good. You'll see people, like I have patients who've had retinal attachment repair, and they're trying to decide whether or not it's worth doing cataract surgery because the eye looks like it's so dead. Or they, and sometimes the external limb membrane looks good, and that often is predictive of vision. So external limb membrane, then you get the myoid zone, which is the part of the receptor outer segment that doesn't have much in it. And then the ellipsoid zone is the part that has the mitochondria. So your outer segments, the mitochondria, are stacked like spaghetti. Um, like a handful of spaghetti, and they're all in the outer part of the, um, of the body. And that's where you see the bright line that reflects. And then the outer segments of the photoreceptors are transparent to light, which makes sense. It makes sense most of the retina is transparent because your receptors are on the back. 
And then, um, and then you get these other ones. Then these last two bright lines are the RPE cells. So the last two bright lines of the OCT are the back of the RP and the front of the RP. The back of the RP is probably where most of the RP mitochondria. The front of the RP, like we talked about, I think two or three times ago, is this phagosome zone, which at the moment is considered the interdigitation zone. And we'll talk about that a lot in conference, but you kind of just need to know these. Um, all right, so that's that. Okay, there. OCT angiography is a little tricky because I don't have one at the moment, but there, I think you have one, but there, um, there, the principle is you're doing OCT and the cells are moving. So you've got this variable reflection. So if you imagine me, you're taking like five pictures of the front of the room as I walked across the room, and then you subtract the background, everything that's not changing, you would see me moving, and that's what OCT angiography is. Um, it images everything that moves. It requires fast acquisition, so you need those source guys. And um, there's pros and cons. So the pro is it's a 3D view, and it's very high resolution, and it's fast acquisition. There's no injection, and the per image cost is low. People are trying to talk about the cost uh, because you're not injecting and all that. The con is the equipment's very expensive at the moment, and also a con for me is it's changing. I don't know that the equipment's not going to be better next week. Um, the other one is at the moment, the, the, you know, this wide one, I'm not sure how, the, this is um, the Zeiss machine, but you, usually you get a very small window with the OCT angiography. And the other thing is it doesn't show you leakage. So you're not, the whole, one of the main things about fluorescent angiography is looking at the functionality of the blood renal barrier. And same thing with ICG, and this doesn't show you that, it just shows you the vessels. But as you can see from this image, which I got off the TopCon site, I think, um, the, uh, it does show you more detail. So you don't get the smudging out, so you can see where the vessels are. And the other thing that's being worked out is the artifacts. So there's pros and cons of OCNJRP. At the moment, people are having trouble thinking exactly where it's important. Um, it's really cool for MacTel. So any questions about um, all that? <laughs> This is an enormous amount to cover in one lecture. So try to go over it. I mean, I'll, I'll put this up there. You can rewatch it. It's all in your book. You just go through your book. But it's all, this is all stuff we'll cover in conference. And then the last thing we're going to cover is ultrasound. So it's important if you have a, a poor view of the posterior pole. I have, I have one patient who has Coats disease, one eye, and a pupil that's literally one millimeter to two millimeters on a good day. And we, I can sometimes see his retina. I can sometimes get an OCT, but I can always get ultrasound. Um, corneal opacities, anterior segment and vitreous opacities, masses you're trying to assess, retinal detachment, dystrusin is helpful. Honestly, autofluorescence is nice for that and if you're looking for a foreign body. This is a patient with a melanoma I saw years ago. You can see the melanoma and you can see you can measure the size and all that. And then the pro positions. To my knowledge, no one ever taught me this. So you need to know the pro positions. Basically, if you imagine, the first step is the probe's always pointing up. So that little marker always points up, unless you're horizontal, in which case you can't point up, and then you point toward the nose. So it's always up, and then if you can't go up, like up, 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 toward the nose, towards the nose. Okay, and that's your pro position, it's a standard. And then there's three different cuts you can get. Transverse, which is parallel to the limbus, where you're doing longitudinal, where you're <coughs> perpendicular to the limbus, and then axial, where you're going through the uh, optic nerve. And uh, the axials, you're supposed to center on the, on the cornea, so you lose a little bit of the image. So your axial, we almost always, the, the image I always put in the chart is a horizontal axial. I always save that, because it sort of shows the macula and the nerve. Even if it's a retinal detachment, I'll save the horizontal axial. And then what I do, my, my ultrasound pre-programmed routine is to do, um, horizontal axial, and then I do a T, 12, 3, 6, and 9, and I sweep. So, uh, and you, the other thing, the transverse images are better because you're avoiding the lens, so you're going behind the lens, so you're just going through sclera. And you can go right on the eye or through the lid. I'd say I'd do some of both. You probably sh should go through the, right on the eye with some anesthetic. So I'll, I'll do a, and I'll start at the macula and sweep up, sweep up, sweep up, sweep up, and you won't miss anything. Things to avoid pitfalls on ultrasound to avoid are ultrasounding too anterior and catching the lens and thinking it's a ciliary body melanoma and removing the eye. That's bad. And then um, also ultrasounding not far enough in the periphery to pick up retinal tears. 
because the retinal tears are pretty far peripheral. And I would say most, of, I think almost all my patients who have had a hemorrhagic PVD with no view of the posterior pole of the tear, I can usually find the tear. It's a little tricky inferiorly where the, where the um, blood settles and you get high reflectivity, but it, it tears look a little different. So this is an eye, hold on. Okay, yeah, this is a patient I operated on yesterday. So, and this is to show you, is this a retinal detachment or not? It's really hard. Actually, yeah. I have to say, I talked to a retina doctor who got it wrong. Yeah. Why not? Mm -hmm. like it's you can see the vitreous. Yeah. But what about the thing in the back? Yeah. It's, uh, it's not. Like an highlight. Yes. And the reason it's highlighted, it's, it's, this is a chronic vitreous yeah, hemorrhage. Awesome. The reason it's not is because in a retinal detachment, you do not get discontinuities in the reflection. So if you can find, it doesn't matter how bright it is, it, like that, that's super bright, but it doesn't go all the way out to the edge. You see how there's a discontinuity? Yeah. So, you, and you don't get that in retinal detachment. I, sorry, would, I didn't see the discontinuity. Yeah, would you mind pointing to the... Okay, hold on, like let me go dark, here. Dark, um, yeah. Here, so here you get the bright, like there. So it's bright, 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 but not bright anymore. Okay. So any place it's, you get bright and then it's not bright. Um, hold on. And here, well, that's not. But here, you see bright all the way across, but then it stops there and stops kind of there. Got so it. it's not, and it's not like there's calcium shadowing. Um, and here, you can see it. The back one is bright, but you see it stops on both sides there. So for contrast, so that's not a retinal. So that's a. She had a hand motion vitreous sandwich. I can see anything. But I watched her for um, three months, and I just operated on her two days ago. Oh my gosh, the eye was blue, but it wasn't detached. And then this is a detachment. So this is a, I just, I don't normally all shout detachments. I got it for teaching purposes. See how it goes all the way out? Yeah. And it moves, I mean, but the other one moves. And when you, when you do dynamic, the eye move, wiggles some. It, it, this is striking. I mean, this is why post-retinal detachment patients, I don't let them read for a week. I don't, and even for two, you know, recreational reading. When you read, your eyes ricochet. You know, it's amazing the movement you get. In, in the retina with, with eye movement. I mean, that look at that, it's forces. So I, I make people do no recreational reading for a week, if they have to read for, you know, pay their bills. So that's retinal attachment versus vitreous hemorrhage. The only time I've been tricked was a giant retinal tear detachment. When I first, when I first got into practice, it was like my first month in practice, and, you, and perforon was hard to get. I had in my, literally had a vial in my locker back then. We used to keep it in our locker because it wasn't FDA approved yet, but you really need it for giant retinal tears. And I had a patient where the ultrasound was clean, showed no detachment, but they clearly saw a shadow. There was like, they said, I see a shadow, I'm losing half my vision. And, and you can see it, patients with vitreous hemorrhages can see their detachments through the vitreous hemorrhage. And I took them in and there, there was a giant tear detachment. So. It's interesting. So that's all of retinal evaluation. So ophthalmoscopy, it's a lot for one talk. Ophthalmoscopy, SLO uh, images, fluorescein, ICG, OCT, and B scan. And, um, and we'll be in conference, we'll be showing all those. I'll try to bring in some ultrasounds, but mostly we do the other stuff, and um, you just kind of need to know in the book. And I'll um, thank you for your attention, and I'll put up uh, some quizzes. And it's a long conference. Is this okay, though, three hours? Yeah. yeah. Perfect.